I want to tell you about one of my secret places. I want to tell you one of my secret spots. How many of you guys have a secret spot? Anywhere you like to go that people don't know about? Secret place where you like to get your head clear? Well, I like to keep mine secret typically, but I'm going to tell you my secret place today. So I have more than one. I actually keep like a log of secret places and secret adventures and started keeping it before I had kids. And So this is a secret place I found when I was in college. So that was a little bit ago. And uh, it's in Slow. And it's by a creek. And it is a creek. And it's kind of hard to access spot. I don't think it's illegal to access it the way I do, but it's kind of hard to access it. So every time I had ever been there, it was empty. There was no one there. Just a beautiful flowing creek. You know, it's a little higher when it's raining. It's more water flowing. And it's a little lower, but it's always trickling. There's always water there. And uh, it's beautiful trees hanging over it. You guys ever been to a beautiful creek like this? Anyone found this just beautiful creek? Hopefully you don't know my spot, but I'm going to tell you more about it so you might be able to find it. Anyways, I just remember going there as a college kid and being like, this place is awesome. I just go there to be alone. Just pray and jump from the rocks, rock to rock, jump across the creek. You know, find place under the shade and then sit in the sun and I used to be kind of a, a weirdo. I'd like try to suntan back in those days. Now I protect my skin because there's this thing called skin cancer. But anyways, uh, I remember thinking, hey, this would be a fun place if I was ever dating a woman or had kids. It'd be a fun place to bring friends. And so anyways, I did eventually. I had this girl's date named Marina and I took her to this cool creek. And, and then when it came time to propose, I took my guitar to this creek and had a ring in the guitar case and wrote her a song and then pulled out, you know, cheesy song, Here's the Ring. She said yes, and that was at the creek, and then I had kids, and I was like, man, I want my kids to see this special place. It's become so special to me. It was special before I got married, and I take my kids there and, you know, put their little floaties on, and I was like, this is going to be fun. There's even a water hole they can swim in. I took them to this beautiful water hole, and they, I totally, you know how you, sometimes you build up the anticipation for kids? You're like, this is going to be so amazing, and then we got to the water hole, and it was filled with green algae, just like the nastiest swamp gross juice, green, mossy, like wet, fuzzy stuff. And I was like, hmm, I don't know what to do. Should I like persevere or should I abort mission? And I think that time we aborted mission, went home and I was like, how can I fix this? And I, next time I came with a big rake and a shovel and big sandals so I wouldn't have to feel it with my feet. I was like, this is going to work. I'm going to clear out all the yucky stuff. It's just going to be beautiful flowing water all to ourselves. So I go and do that. And you know what happened? It just made it nastier. It just made it murky and dirty and yucky. There was like nothing I could do. So I was like, darn it, let's just get in the water, kids. So I just plumped them in. And it's like this little water slide area, literally like it's the, the rock, but it forms where the kids can just slide into the water hole. And we made the most of it. We made the most of it. Well, the reason I'm telling you this is because I think that uh, the life of a Christian is supposed to be like flowing water. I really do. And I think that so often our life can become kind of like stagnant water. And I think that if we're doing this thing called life the way God made us to, I think it's going to be like flowing water. And when we open Genesis today, particularly Genesis 26, we see a guy named Isaac, and we see some kind of similar things than what I'm trying, going to teach you about. He, he discovered some wells of flowing water. And those are significant because growing up in Israel, uh, a desert climate. How many of you guys think wells are pretty important? Pretty important, yeah. Someone should name their church the well. That'd be a really cool church name. I'm just saying. It's a cheesy joke. Every time wells come up, I'm going to make that joke, and I need you to laugh every time I make it. Anyways, uh, but I think there's a greater meaning behind this chapter. I think it's more than just about people finding water in the desert. I really think it's about the life that God made us for, the life of knowing Him, the life of flowing water. So I want to pray for you and pray for me as we read this together today. Father, I just thank you that, God, you're real, and that you are not the father probably that we've made you to be. You're not a father that we make up in our image. You're not like our earthly dads, God, but you're this perfectly heavenly father uh, to whom everything belongs and who wants to give us everything. You want to give us yourself. You want to give us your kingdom, and you want to give it to us free of charge just for trusting you, just for receiving you. Man, God, you are so good. It's beyond anything we can fathom. And God, I just pray even today as we're in your word, things would change in our mindsets. God, I pray where we, where we have not seen you the way we should, I pray you'd open our eyes today. God, where we've not seen ourselves the way we should, I pray you'd open our eyes to see you today, God. May our lives be characterized by the flowing water in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys ready to read? All right, let's read this. Chapter 26 it says this, Now there was a famine in the land. Besides the previous famine that had occurred 
in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And let's stop there for a moment. So this chapter, man, I, you guys are probably thinking it's going to start off really happy, easy, visiting a creek with their kids. Nope. It starts off with a challenge. It starts off with difficulty. I wonder how many of you, some of the best things in your life have started out with difficulty. Anyone in reflection and hindsight, you're like, that was not fun going through it, but God did some good things through that difficulty. Well, that's what's going to happen in this chapter. It's going to start out with difficulty, but it's going to end in blessing. I just want to tell you that. If you're in the middle of a challenge today, I don't want you to discredit what God can do in the middle of your challenge. There was a famine in the land. This is not the first famine, and the writer wants you to know that. It's probably Moses penning this, writing it for the Israelites, wanting them to know where they came from and what's happened before them. And Abraham experienced a famine too, and that was a story we read about. I taught you about that probably a couple months ago, and Abraham, eh, he did so-so when the famine came. That's Isaac's dad. He, uh, he took things into his own hands, probably. He went down to Egypt. God didn't tell him to go to Egypt, but he wanted to find a place where there'd be food and water and productive farms and life so that he could survive. I mean, how many of you guys have ever made a, a decision for less noble reasons than that? At least he was trying, right? He's thinking with his head, thinking for his family, but God didn't want him to do that. Nothing good really happened in Egypt when he went there. So here is Isaac having a similar situation that his dad have, had. I don't know, I just think the scripture writer probably wants us to note that sometimes we encounter problems that are not original. Sometimes we encounter problems that people before us have encountered as well. Sometimes you might encounter challenges that your mom encountered or your dad encountered. Sometimes you might be encountering a problem that you kind of feel like you inherited from someone. You feel like, hey, this isn't fair. I've seen this problem before. Well, there's going to be good news for you if you feel like you're in that situation. So, Anyways, Isaac goes to Gerar, and verse 2 says, the Lord appeared to him. This is a visitation from God, the one true God. This is really special. Not everyone's getting these visits, but Abraham, Isaac, they've been getting these visits from God. He has chosen to reveal himself to these men, to this family. So what happens? Verse 2, the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. Somebody say, bless you. That's not just for when you sneeze. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father, Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. I'll give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me, kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So, friends, this is really cool. I don't know, but sometimes when you encounter a problem that you've encountered before and it didn't go so well, it doesn't just bring with it the problem. It brings with it the trauma of the past. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you have a problem that to other people, it's no big deal, but to you, it triggers you because there's trauma. And I'm not sure, but it's really neat here that God appears to Isaac in the middle of this challenge that is a familiar challenge called famine. And God knows Isaac's already pointing his way, kind of like a duck that points the way it's probably going to fly if a gun goes off. He probably knows Isaac's already looking towards Egypt because he knows there's food there. He knows their, their farms are working good. They have this thing in Egypt called this big river called the... Nile, yeah, so hey, maybe that's common sense. Maybe Google would say go there. Maybe my teachers would say go there. Maybe my dad went there. But God knows best. How many of you guys know God knows best, even in our challenges? So God appears to him and says, don't go to Egypt. It says, stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land. Now, this word sojourn, uh, this is kind of a, th a theme that's going to come up a lot in the rest of your Bible. And it's, it's this idea that there's, there's no permanency, and that was kind of the story lots of times for the Israelites, is there, it was hard for them to ever feel like they were fully settled. And even when they do finally enter the promised land, how many of you guys know it's not all peaches and roses there? They still have challenges. Sometimes they get captured and taken into exile. And it's just kind of this theme that we're supposed to have in our heads that even if we achieve the most, I don't know, seemingly permanent situation on this earth, it's not permanent for the children of God that we're sojourners on this earth. Even if you own your house outright and you built the white fence around it 
and you save for retirement, or, or maybe if you're homeless and you're living on a cardboard box, either way, the Bible would tell you we're sojourners in this earth, that this is temporary, this ain't permanent, and our true citizenship is in heaven. And that's the real permanency that our souls should be longing for and excited for. And I'm okay if you enjoy your house. I'm okay if you enjoy your friends and your family on this earth. But you just need to keep it, keep it in balance. You need to keep it in perspective. How many can say, say yes to that? You can agree with that. But this is not permanent. The worst sojourners. Anyways, this is a natural, physical sojourning that God's speaking to him about. But I believe it also is a prophetic message to all of God's kids who would read this. He says, sojourn in this land, and I'll be with you. God's telling him, look, you know, don't go take this into your own hands. Sometimes me being with you is enough. Me being with you is enough. And I want to say that to you today if you're in the middle of a challenge. Sometimes you just need to know God's with you, and that's enough. You don't always need to know how you're going to work your way out of your challenges. Some of you, you're trying way too hard with the challenges in front of you. And sometimes you just need to know God's with you. That's the first thing God wants to reveal to him. I'm with you, and I'm going to bless you. And I want to talk about blessing a lot today. And that's why I started with that analogy or that illustration of my secret place with the flowing water. Because I really believe that God wants to bless you. And it's not like my favorite sermon topic that I preach every week. I'm not like an a imbalanced proclaimer of blessing. But I also feel like that's in the nature of God. And I don't want to apologize to that for you. I believe it's in the nature of your father to bless his children. I believe it is his desire. I believe it is his um, nature. I believe it's his chosen method for his kids to reveal him to others around us is through blessing. I really believe that. And I wouldn't, you, you're probably wondering, well, where are you going to go with this? Is next you're going to promise me a Mercedes Benz and a, all these riches? No, that's not what I'm going to promise you. But, but God might. God might want to bless you in ways you didn't expect, but not just for yourself. That's where we're going to go with this. So anyways, God says, I'm going to bless you. To your, you and your descendants, I'm going to give all these lands. I'll establish the oath which I swore to your father, Abraham. He's talking about kids, offspring. You remember that God promised Abraham he's going to give him a lot of kids. It'll eventually be a nation, many nations, and the chosen nation of Israel. And within these offspring is the promised offspring that through the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph down through King David, and you know this whole lineage would one day be the Savior, Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's pretty important, and that's probably why these guys are in your Bible primarily, to see these people that God chose to bring the Messiah. So God is, what God is doing here is reassuring Isaac that the blessing was not just for his dad, that the blessing was for him too. That yeah, I blessed your dad, yeah, he walked with me, but Isaac, guess what? You're going to get blessed as well. How many of you guys, I wonder who have kids, you want your kids to not just know God vicariously through you, but you want your kids to really meet and know God yourself. How many people in this room, maybe you don't have kids yet, but some of you have kids, you would want that for them. You'd want them to really know God for themselves. And hey, I'm glad that your kids get to see God through you. And for some of you, that's awesome. And you should be, you should be proud of that. That's a really good achievement if your kids can see God in you. But we also want to pray for them that they will meet God themselves. I'm just going to uh, pray that over your kids right now, that they would encounter God. Even if they've encountered him already, I want them to encounter him again and know him. What a, what a blessing we want for our children. And that's the beauty of this chapter. Is God is meeting Isaac. This is the only chapter in the Bible about Isaac. There's tons of chapters all about Abraham. This is really all the, the press that Isaac gets. And it's cool to see that Abraham didn't just get these blessings of wealth and riches. His son now, even though he's dead, his son is encountering God. What a privilege. What a blessing. And, he, and, and God in this uh, visitation honors Isaac's dad. says, it's because Abraham obeyed me kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Hey, let's, let's read a little more. So how is this blessing going to play out in Isaac's life? That's what the next part of this chapter shows us, is that God promised blessing, and now Isaac's going to experience some blessing, and it ain't always going to look like blessing. How many of you guys know it's better to encounter challenges with blessings than to become a stagnant pond of water? I don't know about you. I don't want to be, I don't want to look back in 20 years and just see that I hoarded the blessings of God in my life and I became a pond of stagnant water. I mean, you guys think Christians sometimes get that reputation that they're not as generous as they could be? They don't live as outwardly focused? They do. I don't think that's the way God intended it. Let's read a little more. Verse 6. So, Isaac lived in Gerar. Oh boy, here we go. New challenge, or maybe not new challenge. 
When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, she's my sister, for he was afraid to say my wife, thinking the men of the place will kill me on account of Rebecca, for she is beautiful. Hmm. I mean, you guys remember, this is a kind of familiar story. Maybe you think that's weird, but this has happened a couple times already in your Bible up to this point. His dad, Abraham, you know, good guy. God, the Bible honors him for having faith, having saving faith, but it doesn't honor every decision he made. And you don't have to do that in this world either. Just because we love and accept people doesn't mean you have to approve of every decision people make. Hello. So anyways, that's the deal with Abraham here. He made some bad decisions, and one of them was, I don't know how nice way to say it. He pimped out his wife twice, at least that we know of. He, didn't, he wanted to save his neck, so he said, yeah, she's my sister, and this guy, Abimelech, or Pharaoh in Egypt, uh, took this woman, and very easily she came into the harem and could have came into bed. And God fortunately saved this situation, not just to save their marriage, but to save the one that God wanted, the promised seed, to come through her womb. Uh, so this was a big deal. God saved the situation, but Abraham didn't do what was right. And Isaac's in this situation again. And like I told you, maybe Isaac had heard his dad speculating here, maybe Isaac had heard his dad tell him the story. Hey, son, I just want to tell you, it's hard having a beautiful wife in these parts. People, uh, they don't always have good desires. Sometimes people get jealous of a beautiful wife. Now you have a beautiful wife named Rebecca. I just want to warn you, I've made some bad, dumb, bonehead decisions thinking I could run this thing better without God. I did it myself, and I sent her off to Abimelech. I sent her off to Pharaoh, and fortunately, God put a plague on them. They all got a disease. And Sarah came back to me, and we got to have you, and things are working out now, but I made a mistake. I don't know if Abraham ever had that conversation with his son, but I just want to kind of encourage you to deal with your own shame so that you can teach your children rightfully what's theirs in Christ. I just want to tell you that none of you in this room handled your past perfectly. And if I made you all stand up and tell stories and exchange stories, I think we'd all say we're probably kind of in the same boat. None of us did... uh, singleness perfectly. None of us did dating perfectly. None of us have done marriage perfectly. None of us did sexuality perfectly, but hopefully we've met Jesus and he is redeeming us. He's made us whole and holy and covered by his forgiveness. And friends, that's where we stand now as we parent our kids, whether your kids are in diapers or they're young adults in college or whatever, we parent them with God's word and we parent them with God's truth and we tell them the truth. And we don't hide from things because of our shame. I just need to tell you that because this happens all the time where parents don't talk to kids about stuff like this because of shame in their past. So I just want to tell you, parents, dig into that. Whatever you have shame about, I want you to give it to Jesus and leave it in the past. Give it to Jesus and leave it in the past. Give it to Jesus and leave it in the past. And I want you to direct your kids confidently, boldly into the future in the Lord. How many of you can say amen to that? How many can do that with me? I know it's not going to be easy, but I want you to do that. I want you to do that. And if you've made mistakes, parents, I want you to tell your kids. I feel like that's going to be the best example to them of how it works to follow Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Rescuer, the Savior. It's not for them to think you did it perfectly, but tell them you made mistakes. Tell them you did dating wrong. Tell them you made some mistakes. Tell them you didn't follow God. Tell them you didn't always obey God. I want your kids to know that Jesus rescued you, not that you're a perfect person, because that's not true, and that's not going to transfer but the gospel will. Anyways, I better digress a little bit because you know I'm reading in this quite a bit. But I'm just saying I wish Isaac had had a better, I don't know, testimony from his dad about what to do in the situation. I'm not going to blame Abraham. But anyways, Isaac makes the same mistake his dad did. How many of us have done that? We've said, I'll never make the same mistake my parents did. And then maybe we find ourselves doing the same thing because that's not how we repent is by blaming someone else. Anyways, it came about he'd been there a long time. Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window And Saul, behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebecca. So, friends, how many of you guys know brothers and sisters usually don't do stuff like that? I know if you're in the South, there's other rules and other laws, but that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about even this pagan king. I'm sorry, everyone from Kentucky, I apologize a little bit. But Google does say you have the most incest. So you need to repent and come to Jesus. He can forgive any sin, even your incest. But I'm just saying, even Abimelech, this pagan king, knows that that's not right. He knows that that's not how brothers and sisters, like, touch each other. The word caressing here, if you, there's different translations. Some some would translate that more like they were flirting together. So this king looks out the window, and he's like, oh, there's the brother and sister uh, flirting. Oh, he he just touched her there. He did not just do that. And then it probably hit him, oh, my gosh, that is, they have lied to me just like, 
their dad lied to my dad, because this is probably not the same Abimelech. It's probably the son or even the grandson. <sighs> so Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she's my sister? And Isaac said to him, ah, Because I said I might die on account of her. What's Isaac saying? He's saying, I was afraid. I was protecting my neck. I was thinking of, I was being selfish. So I lied. That's why I lied, because I was, I was scared for myself. So Abimelech said, what's this you've done to, to us? You didn't think about us. One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. Friends, you know what's happening here? The pagan, idol-worshiping king is rebuking the man of God, the, the Christian Friends, how many of you guys think that still happens today sometimes? It does. And it, maybe it shouldn't. Maybe it should. But I think what's more important is what we do when that happens. I just want to tell you, sometimes Christians have what's called a persecution complex, where we think anytime someone in the world who doesn't follow Jesus says anything bad about us, that it's because they're like filled with Satan, and they're coming against God's anointed, and we get all holier, and God's going to spite you. And sometimes we just need to repent and say, you know what, you're right. I blew it. I was being selfish. You're right. That's not really what I believe is right. I, sh I should have been more humble. I should have been more selfless. Friends, it's okay to do that. I'll just be honest and say, I've had unbelievers rebuke me. I've had unbelievers put me in my fa place. I've had unbelievers tell me that was not humble. That was not kind. That was not respectful. That was not integrous. And I'm like, oh, this hurts double bad because you're not even part of my church. You don't even have a Christian bumper sticker. Hurts double bad, but sometimes it's the best kind of repentance we can get when someone speaks the truth to us. And sometimes in the church, we're all too stinking nice to each other or afraid to tell the truth. And sometimes we don't really let people get close enough to us in the church anyways where they can speak into our life because we're walking in fear and shallow identity and shallow insecurity. So sometimes God says, well, I still want you to grow, so here's an unbeliever. Take this. So Isaac gets rebuked. And he tells the truth. I was fearful. I was selfish. And Abimelech says, don't you understand? You know, this could have been really bad for us. You could have brought guilt upon us, my people. Abimelech charged all his people, saying, he who touches this man or wife shall surely be put to death. So once again, God takes kind of a bad situation in this family's history, and God redeems it, and God still protects Isaac and his wife, Rebekah. Are you guys thankful that God intervenes even when we make mistakes? I'm just thankful. Some of you, you run away from God when you make mistakes. I want to encourage you not to do that. I want to encourage you to run to God. That's the point of these stories. It's not so you'll run away in guilt and shame. It's so you'll run to him. And No, he wants to redeem even your mistakes. All right, let's read a little more. Uh, I still believe this whole chapter, this whole chapter is about flowing water. It's about the blessing of God. And I, th I think that story I should probably say here, here, here is kind of something I want to say. I feel like this is, unrelated, but something God's spoken to me before is God told me one time, don't downplay your blessings. And I, I've done that before. Sometimes I, I fake humble. Anyone know how to fake humble? Oh, you know, it's not that great. Oh, you know, it's not that. I'm not that blessed. Oh, it's just this. It's just that. It's just, but sometimes, no, sometimes God wants to put you on display because he wants people to see the hand of God in your life. I just want to tell you, don't fake humble and downplay the blessings of God in your life. I was thinking here with Isaac, the Bible tells us that Rebecca was beautiful. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. God gave him a blessing, and he lies. He says, oh, no, she's not my wife. She's my sister. I know the point here is not that he's fake humbling, but I just kind of wanted to tell you that. I want to tell you, don't fake humble your blessings either. Don't downplay the blessings. If God's blessed you in some way, some of you have a beautiful family. God's blessed you, and I want you to be thankful for that. I want you to downplay it. And I want you, oh, you know, me, my family, oh, I'm not that great. Don't say that. If someone wants to honor you and give you a compliment, say thank you. Say thank you. Some of you have a great job, very successful at your job. If someone compliments you and says, wow, you've really done good in your career, I don't want you to downplay, oh, I'm not that great, you don't know, I still make mistakes. I want you to just say thank you. Just say thank you. Oh, it's not me, it's all Jesus. Probably that's partially true. It's probably a lot of Jesus. It's probably also some of you. God works through you. Some of you, you have great health. You're very blessed. You don't have any health problems. You're in good shape. You have good fitness. You have a good history. You have good genetics. Some people are going to notice that and say something. I want you to say thank you. I don't want you to downplay the blessings in your life. I'm, I don't want us to go to the other extreme, too, where we're trying to show them off for the wrong reasons. But if God puts you on display, I just want you to say thank you, okay? Now, Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, okay? 
the story is all about blessing. So Isaac is in that land of Gerar. He's sowed some seeds, and they're reaping a hundredfold, a hundred times what's normal. And the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. Guys, that's like, that was just like, if you were to put that on like an equation, it just went like this. Blessed, uh, rich, growing richer, very wealthy. Like, I don't, there, there's no more words to describe how extraordinary blessed God is blessing Isaac. It's extravagant. It's abundant. It's unparalleled. And, and we're not downplaying that. The Bible wants you to know that. This man was very blessed by God. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him. So the Philistines envied him. He, he's living in Philistine territory, and he has some land, and he's farming in that land, but his land is the most productive, and his crops are the most productive. And friends, God is not all about equality and fairness. God is about extravagance and love. But I'm just going to tell you, when God blesses you, you don't need to feel bad about that because someone else isn't experiencing the same amount of blessing. And sometimes the other way, the way people will come into more of God's blessing is by seeing the hand of God on your life. So right now, God is trying to reveal that he's the one true God, and Isaac is part of this family with this covenant, this promise of God's faithfulness and blessing so they can be the channel of flowing water where God is revealed to them and through them to the nations. And Isaac is so blessed, but people are jealous. People are jealous. And I don't don't think we should be uh, too troubled when people are jealous. How many of you have ever had someone be jealous of you before? Anyone have someone seriously envy you and they're not nice to you? Maybe they don't say, I'm jealous of you, but you can tell by their behavior that they are. Well, here's what happens. Verse 15, now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. It's pretty dirty. That's taking jealousy to a whole nother level. That's not just like writing something nasty on your Facebook profile or your Instagram profile. Uh, this is like stopping up the sources of life, so to speak, that the people in the desert relied on, which are these wells, these springs. It's a lot of work, physical and emotional and financial, to dig these wells, and they're getting stopped up intentionally with earth, with dirt, with rocks. Okay, what happens next? Like, if that's not bad enough, verse 16, Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. Man, so God blesses Isaac. It's all going to be good from here, right? Wrong. More more blessing, more problems. Uh, Now people are jealous of him, and now Abimelech says, we want some distance. We want you away from our land. We want you away from us. So Isaac... Do you think he put up a fight? Do you think he argued, said, no, this is my land. God gave me this land. I, I'm a Christian. I have a word from God. You, you, this isn't fair. I'm going to get a lawyer. No, he didn't do any of that. And I've read like a lot of Bible commentators that say this is because Isaac was more of like a, man, they made him look like a wuss. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't see him as this wimpy man. Like, yeah, Abraham was pretty, I don't know, in some ways maybe he was portrayed as very masculine and he saddled up his donkeys and went to war to rescue his nephew Lot. But I don't see Isaac as a wimpy wussy man. I, I, I really think this is all in the context of how to manage the blessings of God. And I think you'll see that. So verse, 10, verse 17 says, Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. So I don't know. I just think someone needs to hear that today, that just because Maybe people are envious of the blessings in your life or people are pushing you away and creating distance. I don't think that's always a problem as much as we make it to be. I think sometimes the blessings in our life are challenging to manage and sometimes they create issues uh, in relationships. And I think that's just natural. And I think we have this culture war these days that makes everything political and it's the rich are evil and the poor are victims and let's give to the poor and take from the rich and it's this whole thing. And sometimes I don't think that's really the issue. I just think there's always going to be jealousy and envy. There's always going to be unrighteousness and stinginess and greediness. And I think the issue is really what we do with whatever we have. Are we faithful to God and righteous with what we have or are we not? So here's what Isaac does. And this just gets me. And I think this is the life of a blessed Christian. He departs. He leaves, and he settles somewhere else. 
I just think someone, some of you, you guys, have, someone in this room has been fighting a battle too long because you didn't get justice. I just want to encourage you to leave it. I just want to encourage you to leave it. And I just believe God's going to bless you more than you realize if you leave it behind. I don't know who it is. Someone, someone, you still have an issue with your ex. I want you to leave it behind. Some of you, someone owes you something. Someone has taken something from you that you deserved. And I just want to encourage someone in this room to leave it behind like Isaac did today. I just want to challenge you. God's going to bless you. Not from getting even, not from getting what's yours, but by leaving it. I want you to read what happens next. So Isaac, verse 18, Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of, somebody say flowing water, flowing water. I believe this is literal, this is actual, this is factual. I also believe it's hugely prophetic and symbolic of the life of a Christian who comes to know Jesus Christ and lives under the the faucet, the source of blessing. They found this well of flowing water, and then it's all going to be good from there, right? Wrong. The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac. Man saying, the water is ours. So what does Isaac do? Is he going to fight? Is he going to argue? Is he going to get a lawyer? Is he going to, God's going to spite you, throw a lightning bolt at you? No. He named the well Isek because they contended with him. So he gives this well uh, a name, and the name means contention, arguing, or strife. It's like he named it something. I don't know about you, but that's something... I, I, I'm a, how many of you guys, anyone in this room, you love conflict? Anyone love conflicts room? I got admit, I, I kind of like conflict. Not like I go looking for it, but like I want to resolve conflict well. Like I, I know that's a weird desire and dream. Some of you like, you have bigger dreams than that. That's one of my biggest desires in life is to be really good at resolving conflict. And I study it and I run sometimes into conflict to resolve it. Anyways, um, where am I going with that? Man, I almost got lost in my point. Yeah, the well. So here's, here's one thing I've learned about conflict resolution. Sometimes you get into a conflict. You've had this happen before, and people, it becomes an argument. Sometimes it gets a little personal. And sometimes people say things that you're like, that is not all true. You just said things about me and my situation that are false. And here's sometimes what you need to do in a conflict is try your hardest to leave it there and come apartmentalize and step away from it. And then see it for what it is and, and look at it with perspective from God and name it something. And name it something and say, nope, this was, this was good, this was bad. Okay, that person, you gave me a little gold nugget there when you showed me what I could have done better. I'll take that with me. But when you leave it here on the table, you can really resolve that conflict from a higher perspective. I kind of think that's what Isaac does here. And he names it. He says, look, this is contention. This is strife. This is arguing. He's like, this is not good. And it appears he gives it up once again. He gives it up once again because he's going to dig again. So what happens next? 21, then they dug another well. Another well. God, Isaac's just finding springs of water. He is like blessed. He's going back to these wells of his father. And he, he named this one, oh, excuse me, they quarreled over it too. So they named it Sitna. You know what this one means? Hatred. Hostility. Verse 22, he moved away from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth. For he said, at last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. I just want you to see, this is just such, I believe this is the way of Christ. I believe this is the way of Christ for the Christian, is leave these things, these things you're fighting over in life, these things you're grasping for. You want justice. You want someone to say sorry to you. You want someone to make up for what they took from you. Sometimes when you're in that situation, God's going to tell you, leave it there. Give them the better deal. Give them the blessing. Give them the forgiveness. Give them the money. Give them the whatever. You pay the bill. You pay the receipt. Give them Christ. Give them love. And then go dig another well because God wants you to be flowing water, not a stagnant pond. How many of you guys have had that happen in your life before? Man, it's weird. This is weird advice. I've, had, I've been in this situation and people gave me that advice and I didn't like it. I was like, don't you tell, I'm going to get a lawyer for this situation. I'm going to make this even. I'm going to make this fair. And they're like, no, I don't think that's what God's saying, Josh. I think God's going to bless you bigger than you realize. Man, I, I really believe that today. Someone needs to hear that. So, Anyways, he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night, said, I'm the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I'm with you. I will bless you and multiply to your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. So Isaac built an altar there 
and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. I just want you to see that this is so uh, important that Isaac is blessed everywhere he turns. And it's like nothing that comes against him from outside, no uh, contender, no plan from Satan, uh, no neighbors, nothing can stop the blessing of God in his life when he is living like flowing water and not a stagnant pond, when he's living with open hands and not clenched fists. Oh, man. Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisors, Ahuzath and Phicol, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and you've sent me away from you? They said, listen to what they say. We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. Wow, about time. Finally, you see it. Sometimes it takes a while, but finally they're going to see it. And that's what we want. Isn't that what we want for people to come to see Jesus Christ? I don't want fairness if I can have people get saved. I don't want my end of the deal to be even. If I want, I want people to meet Jesus. Anyways, we see plainly the Lord's been with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us. Let us make a covenant with you so that you'll do us no harm, just as we've not touched you and have done to you nothing but good. Wow. Is that really how you see it? Okay. And I've sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Then he made them a feast and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged those. Then Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. Now it came about on the same day Isaac's servants came and told them about the well which they dug and said to them, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of this, the city is Beersheba this day when Esau was... Oh no, I'm not going to read that part. That's for next week. I want to stop there. I'm going to conclude this message now. Hey, friends, I really think this uh, is a good message for somebody, maybe just one of you, maybe a few of you, maybe five of you, maybe all of you. But somebody needs to hear this today, that God wants to bless you and he wants you to live a blessed life. And I don't know if you have anyone else in this room telling you that, but I want you to be so stinking blessed that you have leftovers to share with people around you. And I want you to apologize. And I want you to live like an orphan at, underneath the table eating the crumbs. I want you to be seated at the table eating a feast. That's something that David says, God, you serve a table before me, even the presence of my enemies. And friends, if our heart is in the right place and our eyes are focused on who we are in Jesus, you can enjoy a feast every moment, even in the midst of arguments and hostility and contention with conflict, with people envying you, people not understanding you. And sometimes the challenges in your life are not as bad as you think. Sometimes it's God trying to get you to see how much he wants to bless you when you'll be a river and not a pond. Hey, I, I don't want to just give you nuggets today. I want you to stand up, and I want, you, I want something to happen today as we pray, where you leave this room different, and your life is different. And I'm not trying to make light of the challenges in your life, and I'm not trying to give you a prescription. Some of you really need to seek the Lord after this. You have a situation that's more complicated, and I didn't address your situation uh, in depth and, and with all the specificity, specificity that it deserves. I understand that. But uh, I think the bigger point is I want you to live a blessed life, because God wants you to live a blessed mm -hmm. life. I don't care right now how much money you have. That's not the point. Uh, it's not the point. It's a very small part of it. I want you to be blessed right here. I want your soul to prosper. I want your mind to prosper. I want you to live with an awareness of whose you are. That you belong to him. God, I just thank you that... I just thank you, God, that you're into this digging of wells. God, that in every season we are in, there is fresh water if our eyes are on you. God, I just thank you that sometimes the way ahead is to release what's behind us. And I just thank you that today there's grace to release something. Someone's not getting their fair end of the deal, but today they're giving that to you, Jesus. God, I just thank you that there's someone here today that they've seen life through a lens of scarcity and lack. And today that's changing. Where today their eyes are going to see, I am a child of God Most High. And I live in the land of abundance. And I live in the land of a hundredfold blessing. And I just want to pray over someone's uh, finances today, that you would surrender that to the Lord and experience blessing. You wouldn't live in fear. God doesn't want you to live in fear. He wants you to live in faith. Uh, someone today, I want to pray over your marriage. You've, you've, you're just eating the crumbs, and you've just coped, and you've tolerated, and now you're, you've accepted that. I just want to pray that would change. Pray that would change. You're going to press in for more. You're going to press into the conflict. You're going to release the hurts and resentment. You're going to give those to Jesus because you belong to him, not to your spouse. You belong to Jesus. Uh, there's someone in this room. Uh, 
I just believe devil's attacking you in your mind. And I just want to pray. I, I know that's a complicated issue. But I, I know there's many aspects and factors. But I just want to pray that the, I just want to pray there is hope for your mind. There is a future. There is wholeness. There is healing. I just want to pray there is a path. The Bible tells us there's an escape in everything. And sometimes escape has many factors to it. I just want to, I just want to declare of you there is an escape. I just want to pray that into your life. There is an escape. You've said, no, there's not. And God's word says, yes, there is. Might not be the one everyone's told you, but there is an escape. Uh, yeah. I don't know, someone in here that you, you just, you're, you feel like you're such a victim of hostility and uh, contention in your family. And I just want to pray over you. You're part of a new family. You're part of God's family. I, I'm sorry for what your mom and your dad and your brother and your sister did to you and your kids. I'm sorry. But that's not your primary, primary family anymore. You're part of God's family. I want you to live from that place. I think we have a ministry team. Can you raise your hand if you're part of the ministry team? There's a few hands going up. If you need prayer, I want you to find one of these ladies. They're, they're prepared to pray for you and minister to you. God's still working. I don't want you to feel like you have to run off. Of course, if you do, that's great. If you want to meet someone before you go, too. I think I'm going to go to the uh, back door, and if you want to, I'm going to just bless people as they leave if, if you want me to pray for you. I'd like to do that as well. Um, I think today's a date, hopefully, for um, new beginnings. Uh, like I said, I don't want to just give you sermons. I want God to bring life change when we gather. Love you guys. God bless you. God bless you.